Major support for Do the Math has been provided by Chevron, the Kern County Superintendent of Schools, Edison International, Valley Strong Credit Union, California Resources Corporation, Bakersfield West Rotary Stroop Family Foundation, Panama Buena Vista Union School District, Bakersfield City School District, Kern High School District, and AC Electric Company, with additional production assistance provided by these supporters of education in Kern County and throughout the state of California. Well, good afternoon and welcome to Do The Math. I'm Michael and in studio with me right now, I've got Jack. Jack, if somebody needed to get a hold of us here, what would they need to do? For math homework help, call 661-636-4357. You can also call toll free 1-800-66-636-6284. Email, our email is at do the math at kern.org. We're online at do the math online.net and on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. All right, thank you for that. Jack, why don't you let everybody know where you go to school and what grade you're in? I am a fifth grader that goes to Leo B. Hart Elementary. All right, and they are the Hart Hawks? Hart Hawks, yes. Hart Hawks, and have you been a Hawk for a long time? Yes. Since kindergarten, first grade? Since kindergarten. Oh, wow, so you have been, you're pretty used to the way things go on over there. Yeah. If, so you guys, they're talking about bringing you back to school this spring, okay? And let's just say you get back to school in this spring, but let's think a little bit like next year, all right? You go to school next year at the beginning of the year as a sixth grader. What is one of the things you're most looking forward to when you go back? Uh, I guess uh, field trips and gate. Oh, well, there you go. So going to gate class and field trips and things like that? Yeah. All mm -hmm. right, good. Well, always good to have something to look forward to, and it's excellent that you, uh, so you enjoy the gate program? Yes, a lot. Good. Glad to hear that. Well, you know what? We have quite a bit of math for you to do this afternoon, but before we get to any of that, let's first take a look at today's Math in the News. All right, well, today's Math in the News, once again, we are fortunate enough to have somebody visit us, and we have somebody a little extraordinary today. Anna East is a systems testbed engineer at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena. She's worked on the Mars 2020 mission for the past two years, building and testing the Perseverance rover and its twin on Earth named Optimism. Once Perseverance lands on Mars, she'll help operate the rover on the surface. So Anna East, thank you once again. We are more than thrilled to have you as part of our program. Yeah, thank you for having me. I, I, I know that you've got a lot of stuff going on and tomorrow is going to be a very, very big day for you and everyone associated with NASA. So what I'd like you to do is maybe talk a little bit more about your specific role uh, as an engineer and how did that start? Right, so uh, like you said, I am a systems testbed engineer, which is a mouthful. <laughs> But in trying to explain that, uh, the rover has a bunch of different pieces, right? It has a it's like computer, which is like the rover brain. It has cameras, which are like its eyes. It has a radio that it uses to talk to us and we use to talk to it. Um, it also has batteries, which give it power. It has wheels that it uses to drive and it has a robotic arm. Now, all of these different pieces are built by different teams. My job is to take all of these pieces, put them together, and make sure that they work how we expect them to. Um, you know, when you combine all of these pieces, does it make a rover and does it behave like how we think the rover should behave? So you've got quite a bit on your plate right there. And I know yeah, that you, a, you have been people. working on this for the past two years, but how long has it been since the idea? Like somebody was like, hey, you know what? Let's try to do something on Mars. 
And how long does that process take, or is that all encompassing in this past two years? Oh, definitely not in the past two years. Um, from the idea of perseverance, from saying we're going to do another Mars rover and we're going to make a mission, to landing tomorrow is somewhere around 10 years, maybe give or take a couple. Um, you know, someone had to come up with the idea of, okay, we're going to do another mission. But then there are a lot of questions that come from that idea. What is this mission going to do? How is this mission going to do what we need it to? And then how do we build it? What's the design that we need to come up with to make sure that this rover, this mission answers the questions that we want it to answer? Um, and then after that design is done, you build all the parts, you put them together, you assemble a rover, and then you test it. Um, and then you launch it. It takes eight months to get to Mars. And then before you know it, you're landing on the planet tomorrow. <laughs> and that's coming pretty soon. So I know there yep. are a lot of things that you would like to accomplish during this, but what is one of the, the, the main purposes of this mission? So this mission has a couple of uh, main objectives. One of them is to search for signs of ancient life on Mars. So we are looking for any signature that life may have existed billions of years ago on the red planet. Um, another thing that the rover is doing is taking samples out of rocks on Mars, where they are about the size of a test tube. We're going to store these samples, and then a future mission is going to bring them back to Earth. Um, so Perseverance itself takes 10 years, but searching for ancient signs of life on Mars that life could have once existed or you know, bringing samples back, these are things that people have wanted to do for decades or centuries even. Yeah. Okay. Now, I know it because it's quite a distance away, Mars, and what's going on. Can you talk a little bit about the communication time and the reaction time difference? Like if something happens to Perseverance, by the time you get that communicated back to you, figure out with optimism kind of what to do and then get that information back. Right. So Earth and Mars orbit the sun. Um, depending on where they are as they're traveling in their circles, they're either closer together or further apart. Uh, right now in this instance, when we land on Perseverance tomorrow, uh, the what we call a light time delay is 12 minutes to get from Earth to Mars. Um, and that is a radio signal that travels at the speed of light, takes 12 minutes to get from Earth to Mars. So if you commanded the rover, it'd take 12 minutes to get there. If the rover did something and sent you the signal back saying, oh, I did a good job, that would also take 12 minutes. And so because of that delay, you can't just command the rover like how you would drive a car in a video game. You have to come up with a plan for what it's going to do, whether that's driving for the day or no, you know, program it so that it knows how to get from the top of the Martian atmosphere down to the surface in seven minutes like it will tomorrow. Okay. And I know, that, I mean, there are a lot of components to this rover. Can you talk a little bit about the purpose of the helicopter? Because I don't think there are a lot of students that are quite aware of this part of this. Yeah, so uh, Perseverance is taking a little helicopter with it. It's about, about this big. Um, it's named Ingenuity. Uh, the purpose of the helicopter is to prove that we can fly on Mars. Uh, nothing, and I mean nothing, no airplane, no drone, no helicopter has ever flown on another planet. And this is the first time we're going to be doing something like this. So if we can prove that we can fly a helicopter on Mars, this just enables so many other types of missions. Um, you could send another helicopter with another rover to scout out sites to drive to, or maybe interesting sites that we might want to go to. Um, or you could do another mission that's just a, you know, a bunch of helicopters. It just enables us to do a lot more than what we've done before. I was going to say, just like when drones came into our lives, the amount of capability we had with uh, what we were able to do and look at just rose exponentially, and I'm sure it will with you guys with the helicopters. Yep. Uh, I've got Jack here, and he's got a question for you, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, how can a student like me get prepared for a career with NASA? That is, that's a great question. So I get asked this a lot. I've been trying to come up with a good answer, and I think our rovers could not have been better named. So I think to work at NASA, it takes curiosity and perseverance. You know, scientists and engineers, we're curious. We ask a lot of questions. We want to know the answers. Um, but sometimes getting to that point is hard. The answers that we want to know are hard to get to, and that's where perseverance comes in. Um, you know, 
math and science are not easy subjects. It's kind of the reason why I like them so much is it's challenging and I have to think about it. Um, and so working hard at school, um, if you like math and science, just keep going at it and persevere. Well, there you go. Math and science is the key. And like you just said, uh, if it was easy, everybody would do it. But it does take a little uh, intrinsic motivation and curiosity on your part to uh, go ahead and get going with this. On East, we certainly do appreciate the time you took with us. And uh, all the best. I know uh, big things coming. And I know you guys, who knows if you'll even get to sleep tonight with everything going on tomorrow afternoon. So very exciting thank you all right thank you Anna East. and uh you know that's a very good point about being curious and asking questions because i think that's kind of like what you guys do in your gate program right uh yeah we have to be very curious very creative right and you want to know the answers to questions and instead of just having them fed to you right you want yeah. to go and find those answers on your own so there you go exactly. who knows we may be talking to a NASA engineer here this afternoon. That is today's Math in the News. 636-4357 is the phone number. We do have phone tutors available most Tuesdays and Wednesdays until 530 during most of the school year. And speaking of curiosity, uh, we do uh, find ourselves a little curious around here how things happen. And that's why we're going to continue right now with our seed to harvest and see how that's all going. Hey, we are back with some math in the real world, everyone's favorite part of the show. This is such an exciting time because we get to follow some plants from seed to harvest. And my friend Jeff is here to help us again. Jeff, I know that, gosh, we look at this field and everything's going great, right? But we have to have a guy like you because you know so much more than I do. You're like the, the plant detective, right? There's things that can go wrong in this farming process, right? Well. I wish it would be this easy and, and, and it just, you know, just plant seeds and water and everything comes up nice and easy, but it, it doesn't always work that way. Right. And so we, you know, I'm an agronomist and I, I learned how to study plants and what, why, why plants grow and how they grow and healthy plants. And um, we have to solve some problems along the way. Yeah, and you really are a detective. I love that idea about you got to come in here and figure out some, some signs and some hints about what's going on and be able to diagnose what to do about that right so we have a wonderful crop here and then we look over here and these plants were planted at the same time and they get got the same amount of water but there's some issue here they're a lot smaller so if you being the expert looking at this area what, what's the first thing you look for in a field like this to figure out why some plants aren't growing as well Well, the thing is i, I pull out tools ah, yeah, you know, got so, tool. so so i gotta measure things and, and start using tools to figure out no we don't use these tools <laughs> no no we we use you know first of all we got to figure out what is it is it a disease is it nutrients is it water but most important we kind of look at the plants to figure out like us when we're sick we got to what kind of symptoms is it why is it not growing so we use some different tools so this is a net right here mm -hmm. and it's an insect net so i kind of go out and see first of all is it an insect something suppressing it so what I do is I kind of go out here and I kind of just sweep the plants and I get in here and, and I kind of, I catch what I, in here, right? And, and I kind of figure out, uh, obviously it's not an orange problem, okay? <laughs> no, 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 that's not what no, you no, got. No, 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 It's not, no, these aren't strawberries. No, so we, no, I mean, but heck, yeah, it'd be nice yeah. if it was. So, so we kind of look at the, the catch in here is, is, is there an insect out here? So I'll look at the leaves and know what a healthy leaf looks like and which one's not. So these are all healthy leaves in here. And if there was an insect at the bottom, it would be down here and I'd catch it and they would fly out. But there's no insects here. OK, okay. so so I start eliminate the symptoms like, right. you know, you know, asking a baby, they can't tell you what's wrong with them, but you can see the symptoms. So we look at the plant growth and it's growing big and healthy. And so that's not the problem. Okay. So then we, we look at what's going on over here. Okay. So we can have, you know, we look at the sprinkler pattern. Is it consistent? Now, if you look down, 
right behind us, we'll look down behind us and look at the field and you can kind of see it kind of tapers off here at the end. Sure. And so generally what we find out is sometimes it could be a compaction problem. Maybe this was an old road right here. You can see where it's, it's, it's kind of lower. So sometimes we have it long and consistent. Then we understand the field's telling us it's not so much a disease problem or an insect problem. It may be where the tractors go around. So right. then that's why we're kind of using this cover crop is to help make our soils healthier. And that's what we've got. We've always done a good job in farming about making our soils healthy. You hear about healthy soils. So this cover crop right now is we're growing it and we're gonna grow it up some more and mulch this back into the ground. Now this is a heavy thatch and so what it does, it has a biofumigant. So it'll kill any soil insects and any right. soil diseases right. for the next crop. Right. Yeah. What a wonderful idea. And, and so you're not just planting the same thing over and over and over again and taking out and putting things artificially back in. You really are creating a, a nice environment here right. for the next crop. Yeah. yeah. And so like I said, we're trying to figure out how do we, how do we, this, this side of the soil is, is healthy. Not to say this is bad soil or we've, contaminated the soil is now we know how to address this in the next crop that we may need to go into more cultivation um, compaction issues where the water is not going in but we will maybe address this with more fertilizer right. you know and, and look at it that way but right. this helps us to understand what's going on with this crop and help utilize our, our crops right right dr. Jeff is in the house we are finding out what's going on with these crops. A lot of good things going on, but every once in a while there's an issue, just like there's an issue with people, right? We gotta have those doctors. So a guy like this is super important. We're gonna come back and look at a couple more things that may possibly happen in the field, but we also know there's some more math to do in the studio. All right, always more math. Thank you for that, Scott. And also thank you to Jeff for joining Scott out there for our Seed to Harvest program. He's a man about town, heavily in demand, but we've got him in studio right now. Devin is with us this afternoon. Hey, I saw you guys were just uh, talking about the, the rover landing on Mars. I was just there, you know. It was great. That's where I was. As I, I said, a man in demand all around town. Bring so. a sweater and your own water and learn to like potatoes. So These hopefully you're ready to do some math now. Let's go. All right, we've got Jack, a fifth grade student from Hart Elementary. Let's take a look at the uh, schedule that Beth has on Mondays, and Jack is going to work with Devin to solve one of these problems. So right now we're on number 37. Last Monday, Beth was late for jazz class. She missed one third of the class. How much time is that? So Jack, head on over to the board. You and Devin are going to work on this. So we missed, so Beth missed a third of her class. Uh, and if I'm not mistaken, that was a jazz class, right? Correct. So. Talk us through exactly what we have to figure out to be successful in this problem. If she missed one third of her jazz class, then you would have to have the time of her jazz class minus one third of it. Now, we're not saying she missed a third of I'm, an hour. I mean, right? not a third of an hour. We now, we're not talking about her missing a third of an hour. She missed a third of the whole class, correct? Yes. Correct. So we're not talking about taking away a third of an hour. We're talking about taking away a third of that whole that class. class. Yeah. So is that going to be subtraction or is that going to look division. differently? So let's talk about division here, okay? Um, we can break this up. And instead of dividing it by one third, which would essentially take one and one fourth and break it into chunks of one third, we want to take one and one fourth and see what that looks like in thirds, and then find the value of one of those thirds. So there's a lot of different ways we can think about this, right? Yeah. When you divide values into smaller pieces, we could divide it by a value. If we wanted to find what this would be in thirds, what could we divide by? We can divide it by one third. Well, if we do that, I want you to think about this. There's a relationship between multiplication and division, right? Especially when it involves fractions. So let's just say we were going to multiply by, I'm sorry, divide by one third. Well, we know that if we were to treat this like it was multiplication, oh, I see it now. I see it now. You would be multiplying that would be it by the three. reciprocal. Then that would basically just be making it bigger. And if we think about what the answer is supposed to look like, right? We, if we're saying we missed a third of a class, how much did she miss? And we multiply by three, we're going to end up with three and three-fourths. 
how do you miss three and three-fourths hours of a one and one-fourth hour class? So maybe we don't want to divide by one-third, well, but what can we divide part. it by so we have three equal parts? Three? Three, right. So let's go ahead and try that. We can multiply. Let me go ahead and erase here. We can, instead of dividing by one-third, we can divide this by three. Now, what does that look like? How are we able to divide one and one-fourth by three? Uh, you would have to, um, you have to uh, use the, the reciprocal, so turn that into a fraction, then flip it, so then, but you have to also change this to multiplication, so one and one-fourth times one-third, because I had to flip that. And then I just have to uh, turn this into an improper, which would be 5 fourths. So you converted 1 and 1 fourths to an, a, uh, an improper fraction of 5 fourths so that it's easier to multiply by 1 third. So then now I just multiply 5 times 1, 5, 4 times 3, 12. So what does that 5 twelfths represent? That's that's one third of her class. So she missed five twelfths of an hour of her one and a fourth. Hour. Now we don't really talk about hours like that, right? Like maybe like a, a quarter of an hour is 15 minutes. Great. Yeah. We don't really talk about like twelfths of an hour, right? Yeah. But if we know that an hour is 60 minutes, how could we figure out what a twelfth of an hour is? Uh, then we could uh, turn this into 60 by 5. Okay. So we're finding an equivalent that would get us to a denominator of 60 to represent 60 minutes in an hour. So if we do that in the numerator. We have to, wait, no, you, we did it to the denominator first. Now we have to do it to the numerator. So 5 times 5, 25. So what we're really saying is she missed 25 minutes yeah. of her class, which does represent 5 twelfths of an hour. But 25 minutes is a bit more reasonable for us to communicate. More to like relatable. It's how people talk, right? Yeah. It's how people really talk, right? Nicely done on that first problem. I like the way you guys reasoned your way through that one. Let's take a look at the next one, number 38 in this problem. One of Beth's teachers divides each hour of class into thirds. She uses those six sessions to work with different groups. Which class is this? So when you read that, what do you start thinking about as far as what you have to find? I am... Uh... I'm thinking that we might have to do this again, but with a different total. That's interesting. So if we divide this class, one of the classes now, right, divides each hour into three parts and then uses all six parts, that tells us we're going to have to find a class that is going to have six thirds, right? How would we write that as a fraction? That would be 6 over 3. Now, 6 thirds. As an improper fraction. Which is fine. And you know, I don't like that term improper because it makes it sound like there's something wrong with it. There's nothing wrong with 6 thirds. That is a perfectly reasonable value. It has a value. We know what it's worth, right? Yeah. It means something. In fact, we can relate that to one of these classes. Is there a class whose uh, time in hours is equivalent to six-thirds? Yes, modern dance class. So let's play around with this, right? If we have two hours and we break each hour, let's take um, our hours here, right? Let's break our hours into models of thirds, right? So let's say each of these is an hour, okay? Can we break each of these into thirds? Yes. When we do that, how many segments do we have for each group? We have six different uh, segments. Well, it sounds kind of like the situation in our first problem there. So in making sense of what the piece is and how many of those pieces there are, we can connect that to one of the times we have there. So modern dance has two hours that you can break into six parts that are each a third of an hour each. You guys are close to completion right now. Let's take a look at number 39. Beth's Tuesday schedule is like Monday's, except ballet is half as long and jazz is twice as long. Explain why her total 
is still the same. So that's interesting. So there's a little bit of a shift in two of the classes here. Anything like this, I want to make sure we can kind of write down what's happening to which so that we can kind of look at that and, and have that discussion. So the first class that changes, if you don't mind, tell us what that first chat, uh, class is. So ballet is half as long. So ballet is half as long. Could you go ahead and write one half next to ballet? Okay. And now, jazz is twice as long. So and I like how you wrote times two for jazz, right? Yeah. Let's relate that to ballet. If we say that ballet is half as long, could we multiply that by one half as well? Isn't saying half of it the same as times one half? Uh, yes, but no. Okay, why do you say no? Well, I think that in some situations, that wouldn't work. Let's talk about this situation. Multiplying by half. When we're saying, let's relate this to division, right? Yeah. If we're saying half of ballet, how do we find half? If we're going to use an operation here. You would have to multiply it by half. You would multiply it by half. Another way to think about this is we could also divide it by 2, right? Anytime we, take, we find half of something, we're dividing it by 2. And dividing by 2 is the reciprocal of multiplying by a half. So for ballet, we're going to divide that by half. For jazz, we're going to multiply that by 2. And what they're saying in the problem is it doesn't matter that you do this. You're still going to have the same total number of hours as you did on Monday. So why is that the case? Because, OK, let's say, um, let's say that you, OK, you cut this down, but make this longer. OK. Let's, let's just say you have six pies, for example. Each person gets three. But if you were to change that to one person gets two, another person gets four, it would still be the same total number of pies. That's really interesting. So let's relate that to our time here. Let's take jazz, OK? If we're saying that jazz has, is doubled now, we have two times as much time for jazz, how much time is there now for jazz? That would be one one-fourth times two. Turn that into a fraction, turn this into an improper, which would be 5 fourths. Then you just multiply 10 over 4. 10 fourths. Is it possible that you could simplify that and find an equivalent fraction? Yes. Since we don't really say 10 fourths of an hour. Yes. So it would be 4 goes into 10 two times what's left. Four, wait, 4 times 2 is 8, 10 minus 8, 2, 2 fourths, which could be simplified into 2 and a half. Now that's really interesting. We multiplied 1 and a fourth times 2, and we got 2 and a half for jazz. For ballet, it's asking us to multiply by a half or divide by 2. Well, we kind of did the opposite of that with jazz, didn't we? Yeah. So we know that 1 and a fourth times 2 is 2 and a half. So fact family, we know that 2 and a half divided by 2 has to equal what? Yes. Wait, well, I mean. If we know that 1 and a fourth times 2 is 2 and a half, then 2 and a half divided by 2 one, one and one fourth. 1 and a fourth. Now, the values stay the same, but they just switched positions. Yeah. If we add that new total together, Will it still get us the original? Yes. That's all there is. So that's how we know that the amount of time stays the same for the whole schedule. That's what we were looking for. Some great work right there, guys. And for your effort today, Jack, you've got yourself a meal courtesy of our friends at Chick-fil-A. So congratulations on that. Hopefully you have an opportunity to go enjoy a meal over there and say hi to Troy and all of those good guys over there. Good stuff at Chick-fil-A. Hey, we have phone tutors available until 5.30, and you know what? We have an opportunity right now to continue. We'll see what Scott and Jeff are up to as we continue our Seed to Harvest. Hey, we are back with Math in the Real World and my friend Jeff, the uh, plant doctor, 
trying to figure out what's going on with some some issue. If there's an issue in the field, this is the guy we call. But Jeff, this this to me looks like a great field, except for when I look at it, and I know nothing. There's obviously something wrong with these plants because they're purple and those ones are green, right? There's something something eating these things or something getting in, in the soil. What's going on here? Well, yes, I, I would agree with you a hundred percent, but. But no, that's but not no. today. Okay. So this is called red cabbage. Okay. Okay. Right. And this is called green cabbage. Well, right. And I you guess. can see if you look down the road, they round just short of green cabbage. And so they just finish planting. But you're you're right. There is something unique going on. But we'll we'll look at another field here in a little bit that looks similar. Right. But the plant's telling us, hey, something's wrong here. And there's some differences, but that's what we look for. Sure. Is it's it's nothing rocket scientists being a rocket scientist to understand what's going on with the plants because they tell you and you can see the symptoms of what's going on. But what's interesting right here, I'd like to share the opportunity, is we just recently cultivated the field right here. You can see that soil is nice and loose, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And and you can see where the soil is kind of broken up. And then also you can see this little little groove right here right here we came right here and we like the planting shank we put fertilizer down in here okay and it's down right at the root level now I tried to dig earlier to see if we can find the the decomposing chicken pellets but they've already broken down but this is how uh, you know when we put the sprinklers on you can see the sprinkler line here sometimes we get compaction from the sprinklers themselves. So we have to kind of break up the soil in order to, to get the water into the ground. And then also we cultivate why we did where we go through and disc right here and break up the soil. We're trying to, to get these little seedlings right here. Now on this side right here, here's a little weed right here. A little, uh, so we're trying to eliminate the, the wheat, the seeds there, okay? So that's a, I don't know where that's coming from, but um, anyways, these we have all these little seedlings coming up for weeds. So we go through and, and, and we this to remove the weeds and don't apply a chemical. That's the thing about organic, I mean, uh, integrated pest management is in farming, we use cultivation as a source to prevent chemical right. herbicides. Right. So we went through and eliminated as much as we can. Now, we'll see here in a month or two, if we have to come through, um, you can see a, large, a few more weeds coming that they'll put a, a weeding crew in here to go after these weeds um, right here that are getting bigger. Um, so that's what we're gonna go is these weeds is an unwanted, a weed is an unwanted plant in our plant. So it's gonna take nutrients on waterway to the crop. Right, so lots of maintenance to be done after it's after it's planted and we can see that there's a couple issues here but you we really want to go and take a look at uh, another area where it's even more obvious that there's something happening and we got to call a doctor like you so let's go take a look all right jeff so weeds are a problem we do some cultivation to take care of that right we got some bugs and everything but there's some other things that can possibly happen to our crops out here and man you diagnose so well. Tell me what's going on here. Well, first of all, we're farming. You're not getting dirty. I'm come not on, getting, come on. Get you, you, you gotta, gotta get, get in there and rub some dirt yes, on the hands. Get your here. Hair, you go. Now we're getting. <laughs> now we're farming, and this is what I love. You know, is um, you can tell when I when I worked, and when my wife knows when I worked, and when I've gone golfing for the day. <laughs> That's right. So, uh, so anyways, just a couple of things going on in this field. Um, if you look behind me, you can see there's something odd going on. Uh, this part of the field. It's not very big, but you can see the leaves aren't fully in color. Mm -hmm. And so uh, if you notice, the leaves are, are a little bit smaller right. than these bigger leaves over here. And so we kind of look at the roots and you can see the roots aren't that vibrant whiteness, okay? And this stuff is really just sticky. The soil is really sticky. So you can just have heavier ground, okay? Right. If we notice along the sprinkler line, that there's more water there right. so it could be just water heavy just air so the, the roots aren't getting oxygen because just like us we need to breathe mm -hmm. these roots and so you can see the the size of the color uh, the discoloration and it's just a smaller head right so um you know and this is the fun part of trying to understand what's going on with the plants and it's just sometimes we have to accept what we have in their soil conditions sure it's yeah. not that we have to go out and put 
everything on the field. It's just a small portion of it. So we have to live with that sometimes, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Yeah, and sometimes you might have a big one right here, right? But yes. you have some damage, obviously yeah. damage on top there. What's yes. going on here? So interesting part about this one, believe it or not, are you are you sitting down for this? I am, I'm ready to go. What do you think would cause something, again, we got to put that in, that detective hat on. Right. And, and something's like poking it. Yeah. What yeah, kind The of... first thought was an insect, but you're right, it's going deeper than that and yeah. it's really clean cut there. So huh? yeah, so what, you know, thing, I'm gonna challenge the students, what insect or pest, right. we would call a pest, has something that has a mouth part that's strong and goes into it. Right, right. So we'll- Looks to we'll, me like not a squirrel, but a bird. It's right? like a bird. Yeah. So that's what happens is we have a bird actually pecking inside of there. And we don't know why if he's going after the food yeah. or he just he just wants to annoy us. Right. But we have birds out in the field and we can't shoot them because if we shoot the bird inside the field, then we have a dead bird and that's not right. good for food, food safety. So we gotta scare them away. Man, there's so much to do, gosh darn. Let's go take a look at some other stuff when we come back next time, but I know there's more to have to do in the studio. All right, thanks for that, Scott. Hey, you know what? There are a lot of students working on order of operations right now. So, Devin, I've got a great problem for you and Jack to work on. You're going to have to work all the way over on the left side of the board to write this down because it's going to take a little bit. Hey, plenty right. of space. Here we go. Open up a set of parentheses or a bracket, if you like, and then open up another one as well. Negative three, and put that in parentheses, times, open another parentheses, ten plus negative seven, and the negative seven is in parentheses, close it again and again and raise all of that to the second power outside that set of parentheses. Divided by 3 minus negative 9 in parentheses and outside of that square the 9, the negative 9. There you go, outside the parentheses. Perfect. All right, Jack, you're familiar with order of operations, correct? Yes. All right. Show Devin what you know. I'll, I'll go ahead and let you kind of talk us through how you're going to start things off here. All right, well, we have to do the parentheses first. Well, that's an issue, right? Because we got a lot of parentheses, if you haven't yeah. noticed. So where do we begin? Especially when we have parentheses inside parentheses inside parentheses. Well, we would begin with multiplication or division. So what's your understanding of which one you do first? I think that, um, okay, since this is the only number in parentheses, wouldn't that mean it's multiplied? Well, it's kind of by itself, right? I think the parentheses yeah. are sometimes there just to communicate to us as mathematicians. Maybe this is just by itself. If we no longer need them, especially in situations where we have um, negative values, sometimes it's okay to remove them if it's clear that we understand that that's a negative. So let's go ahead and talk about that. Can we remove those parentheses since we know that that's simply just negative three by itself? Yeah. So if we recognize that, we can just go ahead and toss that aside. Let's get rid of this parentheses. This is negative three. We know we're gonna multiply negative three times something, likely what's over here, right? Yeah. So let's talk about what's over here. We got 10 plus, in parentheses, negative seven. Now. I think the same thing kind of applies. Do we know that this by itself is negative seven? Yeah. So let's go ahead and just kind of remove that too. Let's make sure that that's clear and we understand what that represents. So there we go. So now this is a little bit easier because within this set of parentheses, what do we have? We have? 10 plus negative seven. Okay, we could do 10 plus negative seven, right? Uh, yes, but you would have to convert to make it easier. Let's do that, go ahead. So since it's a negative, you can't you can't really multiply. I mean, add something, add something positive uh, by a negative, and get uh, something that's more than the positive. So you know that the answer. What you're saying is, when you add a negative, you can't get end more. up with more than what you start with. Yeah. Okay. So since, what do we end up with? Since it's a negative, we could just take this and basically just move it here. So you've associated that adding a negative has the same effect as subtracting a positive. So we're treating yeah. 10 plus negative seven as 10 minus seven. Yeah. Okay? 10 minus seven. 
3. Great. So let's take a look at this bigger parentheses now. We have negative 3 times 3. And in, on the outside here, we have this exponent. So what do we deal with first? Do we clear the parentheses first? Or do we start to square things? I think we have to uh, do the parentheses first and Great. then square it because this is outside. Let's go for it then. So negative 3 times 3. Since if it were a negative and a negative, then that would cancel each other out. Positive, positive. That's just basic. But since this is a negative 3, I think that uh, since we're going positive, we're going back to 0, then adding. So 3 times 3 normally would be 9. But minus, but minus the 3, that would be 6. So I'm, I'm guessing I'm not 100% sure that it's 6. Well, let's think about the fact that we're multiplying, right? So we have negative 3 times 3. Let's think about it this way, OK? I'm going to draw out just a very quick number line here, all right? We, think, we can sometimes consider multiplication as repeated addition, right? Yeah. So if we're multiplying negative 3 times 3, what we're really doing is negative 3 plus negative 3 plus negative 3. So let's take three jumps of negative 3 on a number line. Negative 3 and another negative 3. We're at negative 6 now. And another negative 3. So where are we? We're at negative 9. Negative 9. So that tells us that negative 3 times 3 is 9 on the negative side. So all this boils down to negative 9. But there's something about that negative 9 now. It's not just negative 9. What do we notice is a round up there? Negative 9 squared. So. Go ahead and square that negative 9. What does that get us? That would be negative 9 times negative 9. We can just take these out because, I mean, they basically just cancel each other out, but we have to uh, put it in at the end. 9 times 9, 81. Add that negative back. Well, if they're both negative values, do we keep them negative? I think so, yeah. If we have the same sign in multiplication, we actually end up with a positive value. Oh, okay. So that's an interesting distinction. And so here's how I would relate it. We're doing the negative, the opposite of negative 9 jumps. So the opposite of an opposite positive. is the positive. So this ends up as 81. Let's go ahead and clear some space here, because we know that this whole piece in the beginning, now we have a value assigned to it. That is 81. So we're going to clear this out all the way. We know that this is going to be equal to 81. In fact, let me go ahead and just kind of do a bigger erase here. 81. So now that we have 81 over here, we're still looking at order of operations. Do we have any other parentheses before we continue? Yes, right oh. here. OK, we've got a negative 9 next to uh, exponent of 2. So, hey, it's, it's actually really handy that we just worked that part out, right? Yeah. So, we have a negative 9 squared. What is negative 9 squared equal? 81. We just did that. So, we know that this equals 81, 81 as well. Great. Now, let's rewrite our expression here with all the three parts that we have. We have 81. What comes next? 81 divided by 3. 81 divided by 3. All right. Go ahead and put that down. And then what comes next? Minus 81. So according to order of operations, where do we start here? Right here because of the division. Great. Let's do 81 divided by 3 then. 81 divided by 3. 3 would go into 8 two times. Bring the 1 down. 3 goes into 21. Oh, yeah, I just forgot. <laughs> uh, 7 times. Nice. There's 21 equals 0. OK, so we know that we are at 27 minus 81. 81. So that leaves only one thing left to do here, right? 27 minus 81. How might you approach that? 
uh, we would I, we would have to uh, end up with a negative. We know that it's going to be negative. That's great. Okay. So how do we find out how far negative we have to go? We can um, instead of twenty seven minus eighty one, we can actually flip it. So eighty one minus twenty seven. That would give us six. No, wait, fifty four. But that's how much we have left. But we're at zero. So, so zero minus fifty four. Negative 54. Negative 54. Fantastic. Nicely done. That was a great problem right there, and I appreciate you guys taking it apart in the way you were just discussing the negative and negative, because that's a tough thing for a lot of students to learn. Very easy to forget. Uh, I know that this next problem is going to take a little bit of time, so I'm going to give you guys some time instead of rushing you through this thing. So if, uh, let me clear the board for you quickly. Okay. And let's take a look. We'll get rid of that one also. You guys did a masterful job with that problem. Yeah, we did. So here we go. If 36 gallons of water are poured into an empty tank, then three-fourths of the tank is filled. How many gallons does the full tank hold? So uh, this is a really interesting problem because it's a very visual problem, right? We think about a tank of water, OK? How would you kind of work things out? And I know you're actually very comfortable with drawing out models to explain your thinking. How would you use a drawing maybe to approach this problem? I would maybe just say that this is like a, like a, like a huge uh, jar of water. OK. So if that's a giant jar of water, how many gallons right now do we have in this jar? We have 54. Gallons. You got to 54 really quickly on that because I remember the problem said that we had 36 I mean, gallons 36, of water. 36, okay. yeah. Okay. So this is 36 gallons of water, right? Okay. Yeah. So let me just kind of draw a little bit over to the side here because I want to make a, an illustration here, okay? We know that if this was a full tank, it would have, I apologize, ladies and gentlemen of the world, for that drawing. That is maybe one of the worst rec. That's barely a trapezoid, so let's just pretend this never happened. Oh, you got um, the buzzer today. Maybe the only one. All right, so if we think about this atrocious full water tank as having four fourths as being whole, right? Yeah. What we're saying right now that because three fourths of it is full, that this represents 36 gallons. And each of these is one fourth of the tank, right? So we have three of these fourths. Equaling 36 gallons. If we need to find the size of the whole tank, how does that help us out? Since we already have three parts, we can just take this part out of the equation for now. Then there's three parts left. We would be able to uh, do 36 into three parts, so 36 divided by 3. That would be 3 goes into 3 once, minus 3, 0, 6, 3 goes into 6, Twice, minus 6 would be 0, 0. And uh, that's how much each uh, fourth would be. So each fourth of this tank is 12 gallons. And that's why 3 fourths is 36 gallons. So how does that help us find out how many gallons this entire tank can hold? Each fourth is 12, is 12 gallons, so in order to get 4 fourths instead of 3 fourths, we would just have to add 12 to 36 gallons. And when we do that, what do we get? 36 plus 12, 6 plus 2, 8, 3 plus 1, 40. So how, many, so how many gallons does this entire tank hold then? The entire tank can hold 48 gallons. And thank you for putting that unit there. That is a math teacher's dream. There you go. That is important, putting units there, because somebody might go to 48 degrees, 48 feet, 48 miles, 48, what, it could be anything.
right? So always important to put those units there as Kevin just stated. 636-4357 is the phone number. We do have phone tutors available until 530. We do have one more opportunity today to head on out with our seed to harvest and see what Scott and the rest of the guys are up to. Math in the real world and Dr. Jeff has become Farmer Jeff. Look at this, man, it's amazing stuff. We have some healthy crops because you have been able to diagnose problems, but they don't all look like this, right? No. This is beautiful. Yeah, we're almost there. Yeah. We're, we're, uh, we're getting closer to harvest. We're at mile 25. We're <laughs> almost there. The marathon's not done, okay. but we're close. Right. But the, the race right. is not done. There's a lot of work to, to right. finish before harvest. So we, this is what we want to have happen. We want some nice, healthy crops, but it doesn't always work out like that. What could possibly happen? along the line when we bring you in and say we got to figure out some what's going well, on here well like anything you, you got to know what's healthy and 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 know what goals and objectives we're trying to achieve right. so we will you look at these plants right here this is obviously green cabbage and this is red cabbage and even though it's cabbage they already have some some differences as you can see the green cabbage is much more uh bigger leaf and and then the uh red cabbage is just different and uh, so we'll look at the green one first and start looking at the basal leaves. So a lot of the nutrients will go from the bottom. You know, you need these big solar panels, right? Mm -hmm. So that, that's what gives it the energy to grow. And so if we start looking at the, the basal leaves here and we can see that they're, they're green. Right. Okay. And um, usually we have some white fly problem. You can see a couple of white fly uh, if you look very closely here. Um, you can see a few white fly there on the leaves. And so is it a tree bowl level? No. And so we're very lucky that the temperatures haven't been ideal for them to multiply. And in right. pest management, it's all about managing. We don't, we don't get to zero. Right. And so what we've learned is we watch and look at the, the populations and is it a manageable level? And they haven't got to an economical threshold mm -hmm. and the temperatures, the way they're going, we know it's not likely for them to build, and, and so we can watch it. Right. It's on a watch mode. Sure. So we walk these fields weekly. Yeah. And 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 we constantly. And you find a lot of good healthy stuff, but then right behind you here, you find some stuff that's not very yeah. healthy, right? Well, let's I mean, let's hold on. We're not done with the healthy oh, okay. ones. We got like the we, good we, stuff. We got to keep looking, okay? And so what happens is, you know, moths are very sneaky, mm -hmm. and so mothers will lay their eggs in here. So I got to constantly pull these healthy ones out make sure a moth hasn't laid her eggs in here so sometimes we get close to harvest she'll lay her lay eggs in here and we got to keep looking right and it's kind of like an onion you keep peeling and peeling but we're not done there so we got to make sure that the moth didn't lay its leg mm. egg inside here right so then we cut it okay so we take this beautiful cabbage and cut it down the middle and we look inside what's going on inside and make sure we didn't miss anything. So we look inside and you have this beautiful cabbage head and it's leaves and it's growing from the inside out, mm -hmm. okay? So we're looking at the terminal and, and so we're gonna get rid of this one right here. And so we're gonna keep on cutting right down here, okay? So what's interesting, each plant grows different you know, at a grapevine, you can see it growing the terminal on the outside. So this is the center of the plant, and we're seeing how how this plant is growing from the inside out, even though we don't see the terminal. So everything's looking good there. You can see it's got color in, in the stalk here, and so we don't see any any droppings in here. Right. Now we look at the, the red one, okay? The same thing is we're looking at the leaves here and, and going through, and we break this off. And we'll, we'll making sure there's no uh, aphids or anything growing in the inside. And we'll cut this one as well. It's a little more dense. Cat, red cabbage is much more dense than green. And, and uh, so we, we'll cut this open and, and just take a look on the inside here and see what we have. And now um, everything's looking good and healthy there. Mm -hmm. So the question you had is how do we know... A, a, an unhealthy one, okay? So when we look at some of these leaves, again, this leaf is saying, it's sneezing, it's coughing, and we look at the symptom, okay? And the symptoms is there's some yellowing, chlorosis, and some brownness or blackness in there. So we look over 
and you can see start seeing the spores and that's what you know being an agronomist is studying you know insects is entomology and pathology is studying the, the, the diseases and so if I had a microscope out here I'd look under these spores to see what kind of spore those were then I would identify specifically what organism it's, it's attacking these leaves right and then you have different ones here now some of these are much different you can see and so we look at how what the green leaves are going to yellow to, to down. Now we look at this one, it's a little more advanced here. And then you can see, you know, over here, you're starting to get total breakdown. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. And so what happens is we lose those, those solar panels, mm -hmm. you know, and the, the, you get more mother, what's going on. Now what's interesting about this one is what's going on here, Scott? You see how it's not fully green right here? Right. It transitions. So sometimes you have a thing in Mother Nature called a chimera that it just it just happens. Sometimes you get just weird leaf mutations. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's not necessarily a disease or fertilizer. It's just sometimes you get a mutation, and so this is considered just a mutation, and we wouldn't do anything about it. Right. And the knowledge that you have to be able to discern between a pest and a nutrient deficiency and a mutation. That's why, that's why we have you, have you on here, man. We'd love to learn about this stuff, but we are getting so much closer to harvest, and we know there's more math to do back in the studio. The series continues in the field. We'll be back next time to make sure we can box all this stuff up. All right, thanks for that, Scott. And next week, we will actually wrap it all up and see how this finally comes to harvest. We want to say thank you to Anna East from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena for visiting with us today. And Jack, we were talking a little bit about how uh, if you had another question for Anna East as an engineer, what would that question have been? Uh, how how um, is it like to be a NASA engineer? Like, how is your schedule like? What How does yeah, like, your day look? Yeah, what does it look like? Like, when do you go to work? Do you do certain things all the time? Or is it different every day? What kind of a schedule does she yeah. have? And do you think an engineer might be something that you may aspire to? A type of engineer, maybe. Okay, do you have any type right now that you're kind of thinking of, or you're just like, you know, I'm open to anything? Uh, I'm planning to maybe become, maybe go in the career of medical or engineer. There you go. You do me a favor? Yeah. Whatever field you go into, you come and visit us or Skype with us one time and let us know how things are going? I'll try to remember that. All right. I, well, you know what? I know you got a good memory. I'm going to hold you to that, all right? Okay. Did you learn a little something today? Yeah. Good. Did you have some fun today? What do you think? Obviously. Oh, 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 this guy said, what well, do you, you think? Well, you know what? I That's think you did. Yeah. Obviously, I did. There you go. Well, good. Right. I'm glad to hear it. Well, thank you, Jack. <laughs> Fifth grade student from Hart Elementary, been a hawk since kindergarten. Looking forward to sixth grade next year. We do have phone tutors available until 530 this afternoon. And until we meet again, continue to do the math. Major support for Do The Math has been provided by Chevron, the Kern County Superintendent of Schools, Edison International, Valley Strong Credit Union, California Resources Corporation, Bakersfield West Rotary Stroop Family Foundation, Panama Buena Vista Union School District, Bakersfield City School District, Kern High School District, and AC Electric Company, with additional production assistance provided by these supporters of education in Kern County and throughout the state of California.